I'm very pleased to introduce the next speaker. If I could have the first slide, please. Um, yes, the Show Prize Foundation, uh, as you know, has three large prizes. One of them is in astronomy. And from 2004 to 2022, they have recognized 33 distinguished astronomers for the achievements of excellence or for outstanding contributions to astronomy. And you can see their faces here, and uh, you will recognize most of them probably. It's not moving, okay. Um, the, the, I want now to have just a, to say a few words about the relations between the Show Prize and the IAU. In 2019, the IAU and the Show Prize Foundation signed a collaboration agreement to promote both professional astronomy and enhance astronomy in education. So the Show Prize Foundation provides funding for an annual Show IAU workshop on astronomy for education, which is a key activity of the new IAU Office of Astronomy for Education. And the show prize laureates in astronomy are invited to give a plenary lecture at a GA or any IAU scientific event. So next we will have, following this agreement, we will have a short message from Roger Blundford, who was the show prize laureate in 2020. Hello. Thank you to the president and officers of the IAU for the opportunity to address you at the 22nd General Assembly in Busan. I very much regret that on this occasion, I cannot be present in person in the past, I have very much enjoyed attending these meetings. In fact, my involvement goes back to the General Assembly 14 in Brighton in 1970. At the time, I was a summer student at the Royal Greenwich Observatory in Hurstmansu, and we were employed preparing materials for that meeting. I met my wife, Liz, there, and we are now celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. The reason why I have been asked to talk is that I was accorded the singular honour of being awarded the 2020 Shaw Prize. I was greatly surprised to be included in such a distinguished list. To which must now be added the 2021 laureates, my colleagues Vicky Caspi and Chris Akuvilliotu, and the 22 laureates, Leonard Lindegren and Michael Perriman, from whom you will hear. I am very grateful to the Shaw Foundation and humbled by the award, but also proud to have had a small role in such a glorious scientific story of discovery, involving a much larger community in theory and observation that is still in progress. Let me say a few words about black holes. As everyone knows, the story begins with Carl Schwarzschild and the highlight came in 1963 with Roy Kerr's navigation of the space-time that bears his name. A cohort of younger relativists, including notably Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, elucidated its beautiful properties. Quasars were found at the same time as the Kerr metric, and the connection was made by a few prescient astrophysicists. The early 1970s, when I became a student, were a time of acceptance of black holes and a growing appreciation of their potential role as stupendous cosmic power stations. This was also a time when relevant observations were coming in past. Amongst these was the identification of Cygnus X1 by Louise Webster, who had been my tennis partner at Hurstman Zoo, together with Paul Merton. As a student, I was very fortunate to have been supervised by Martin Rees and Donald Lyndon Bell, who had also been at Kersman Sioux. 
They taught me so much about two different and equally important approaches to astrophysics and have been wonderful colleagues. I was also fortunate to have struck up a collaboration with Roman Znajek, and together we described how electromagnetic field might, in a very natural way, extract the rotational energy of a spinning black hole and power astrophysical jets. There is now good evidence, including that from the Event Horizon Telescope, that this happens. Although the larger story remains an active debate, in which I try to remain a participant, building on ideas I developed with a longer list of other colleagues, including Mitch Beagleman, Aria Kernigal, Noemi Globus, Peter Goldreich, Amy Levinson, David Payne, Tony Reedhead, and Kip Thorne. And to all of these I am extremely grateful. Of course black holes are not the only powerful sources. For example, there are neutron stars, supernova explosions and astrophysical shocks. And we are still finding manifestations of their activity, such as fast radio bursts and ultra-high-energy cosmic rays. Observational discovery and the opportunity for fresh ideas is just as much a feature of the, this research today as it was 50 years ago. So let me conclude by once again thanking the Shaw Foundation for the award of the 2020 Shaw Prize, acknowledging my many colleagues for their wisdom, accomplishment and fellowship over the years, and wishing you a great time at the 22nd General Assembly. Thank you. So this is the first show prize lecture at the General Assembly. And it will be given by uh, the winners in 2022, Michael Perryman and Leonard Lindgren. And uh, the award, as the show prize uh, says, is for lifetime contributions to space astronomy, in particular their role in the conception and design of the Parkus and Gaia missions. Therefore, I'm happy to call on Professor Leonard Lindgren to present his uh, lecture, show prize lecture. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, when we look at the stars on a clear night, far away from the city lights, it is easy to imagine the stars fixed on a sphere that is slowly rotating around us. This concept of a celestial sphere has been with us astronomers and the common man for thousands of years, and it's still a useful thing for describing elementary concepts in astronomy, like the coordinate systems on the sky. You can buy star globes on internet, and in planetaria around the world, this illusion is recreated over and over again. It is the task of astrometry to place the stars and other celestial bodies as accurately as possible on this sphere. But astrometry is also able to break the illusion by showing first that stars move relative to each other and relative to the sun, and secondly, that stars are at different distances from us, as revealed by their parallaxes. In this talk, I am going to take you through a journey over the last 400 years of astronomy to show how astrometry has contributed to our conception of the universe and even to physics as a whole. This is given as an introduction to uh, the main theme of my talk, which is the later developments in astrometry. 
In the early times, from the days of Tikubara, the primary instruments for making accurate positional determinations on the sky were big quadrants and sextants, such as those uh, shown in these images. Of course, these were naked eye observations, and the accuracy was limited by the acuity of the human eye and by how accurately these graduated arcs could be manufactured and read. The invention of the telescope, uh, you would imagine, immediately made these observations much more accurately, but that did not happen very quickly because it was first necessary to make uh, additional technological advancements. The crosshair had to be invented and placed in the eyepiece, micrometers constructed, and very importantly, instead of having quadrants and sextants, a full 360 degree graduated circle was used. Uh, and that has uh, some important advantages. It is more easy to manufacture accurately and by reading such a circle at two opposite points, diametrically opposite points, you eliminate some important sources of systematic errors, for example, the eccentricity of the circle. This uh, effectively defined uh, what became the main instrument for positional astronomy over the next 200 years, the meridian circle. We see here an early example of a meridian circle at the Pulkova Observatory in St. Petersburg. Although the principles of this instrument was uh, uh, the same over centuries, uh, it was, of course, technically improved in many ways. And, and more recently, automated meridian circles were constructed using photoelectric registrations of the passages of stars instead of the naked eye, and even CCDs. These uh, improvements uh, very much uh, made them more sensitive, so you could observe fainter stars, and also much more efficient, meaning that you could observe many more stars in a single night. However, uh, they did seem to hit a kind of limit for how accurately these observations could be made. If you plot the accuracy of star positions through history, in this diagram we have on the vertical scale the accuracy in arc seconds to the left, uh, ranging from a, a few uh, degrees at the top down to a micro arc second at the bottom. Uh, you can see the gradual improvement from a, uh, antiquity, Hipparchus, um, who made a catalog of about 1,000 stars to an accuracy of about half a degree. Tikubare, uh, roughly one arc minute accuracy, but also 1,000 stars. And then gradually larger catalogs were constructed with more and more stars. But by the end of last centuries, these ground-based observations had reached uh, millions of stars, but the accuracy was not uh, terribly much better than what had been achieved in the 19th century al al already. Because uh, effectively, one had at that time reached the limit what the atmosphere uh, allows you to make uh, these kind of measurements, and also the gravitational uh, deflection, uh, sorry, the deformation of the instrument from, from the gravity of, of the Earth. But along, the, uh, along the, uh, the line, a lot of important discoveries were made by the gradual improvement in accuracy. Uh, remember that Kepler discovered his first two laws by analyzing Tycho Brahe's very accurate observations of the planet Mars. And these laws, in turn, uh, were the foundation for Newton's formulation of the, uh, his gravitational theory. Um, the mo movement of stars, their propagations were discovered by Halley in 1718, and uh, about the same time, uh, James Bradley discovered stellar aberration when he tried to measure stellar parallax. Herschel also found that the sun is moving through space 
uh, from his analysis of proclamations at, at the time. Uh, all of these uh, discoveries were based on uh, positional measurements made with quadrant, sextants, or, or meridian circles. But they were limited in accuracy at that time to about an arc second. But beginning with the 18th century, another kind of observations were also made, differential observations within a narrow field, because it was realized that many of the error sources that affect these instruments are eliminated to first order at least if you make differential measurements within a small field. Uh, and the uh, uh, high point of that development was the first determination of stellar parallaxes by Bessel and Struve around 1838, and also by Hend Henderson at the same time. Uh, so that uh, accuracy of the differential measurement is shown by the dotted line in this diagram. And it could be done on order of magnitude better than the positional measurements. Oh, sorry. Um, this, this is how Bessel measured the parallax of, of one star, the double star 61 Cygni. He used a heliometer manufactured by Fraunhofer to measure the angles between uh, the midpoint of the two components in 61 Cygni and two background stars, which we called A and B. And by measuring uh, these angles uh, hundreds of times over a little more than a year, he could derive a parallax for 61 Cygni of 340 plus minus 20 milliard seconds. That is the blue curve fitted to the observations uh, in the right diagrams. Um, and this is uh, less than 10% wrong compared to the modern value, 286. Ah. So this, this technique of narrow angle astrometry uh, got a real boost with the use of photographic plates later in the 19th century. The best instruments for that kind of work were these big long focus refractors like the Yerkes Observatory 40 inch refractor. And later also specially built astrometric instruments like the 1.5 meter strand astrometric reflector at Flagstaff um, uh, US Naval Observatory. But these instruments were still limited to a precision of about 10 milliarc second for the long focus refractors using photographic plates which later got improved to about a milliard second using CCDs in, in uh, the more specially built instruments. To get even higher precision, uh, it was necessary to go to even smaller fields, um, as was shown by Shaw and Colavita in the 1990s, uh, when they considered how to design optical interferometers. The interesting point is that you need to make the instrument or the baseline when it is an interferometer larger than the um, area occupied by the field projected onto the uh, turbulent layer in the atmosphere that, where most of the disturbances come from, about eight kilometers above ground. And, and that means, uh, depending on the field size, you need a bigger and bigger telescope. So if you, if you have um, a field size of uh, half a degree or so uh, to the left in the left diagram, it doesn't help you to get a bigger telescope uh, because you are still in the narrow angle regime. But if you go to really small fields, uh, you get a significant improvement by using larger telescopes or interferometers with long baselines. And, uh, in this way, by using fields as small as a few arc seconds, you could even go down to micro arc second uh, accuracy. The limitations that uh, determine these curves are atmospheric turbulence. And there are a number of interferometric uh, prototypes and uh, working instruments um, manufactured that uh, demonstrated that this is actually the case. And, uh, 
uh, one of the most recent and most successful examples of that is the gravity instrument on the VLTI instrument. So far I've talked only about optical observations or infrared perhaps. But we should also remember that in the radio wavelengths, uh, interferometry has been used for a very long time, since the 1960s, uh, with great success and ever-increasing accuracy. And uh, these networks here illustrated by the European VLBI network and the very long baseline array in the United States, uh, they uh, now achieve regularly 100 micro arc second accuracy globally and 10 micro arc second differentially over a few degrees. However, I will for the most part here restrict myself to optical astrometry. Then we come to the space missions, uh, Hipparchus and Gaia. So Hipparchus was launched in 1989 and the final results came out eight years later. Uh, Gaia was launched in 2013 and is still active and hopefully will continue to work for a few more years. And so far there have been three data releases of data from, from that mission. There are some very important advantages of doing astrometry from space. First of all, the absence of atmosphere me means that there is no refraction there is no seeing, that, uh, which means that the images of stars are sharp and stable. The weightlessness means that you can point the instruments in different directions without uh, being deformed by uh, gravity. And uh, with proper design of the instruments, you can have a very stable environment. Very important also is that you can access the whole sky from a single instrument. This factors all together means that you can do very accurate global astrometry. I will explain later exactly what I mean by global astrometry in this context. There are other advantages as well. You can make continuous observations more or less 24 hours per day over several years and at a moderate extra cost and effort you can get very valuable additional information in, form of, uh, in the form of photometric data in several wavelength bands and even spectra for the brighter stars. And all of this means that you can do surveys to well-defined completeness limits with a good time sampling and uh, at the same time get very valuable astrophysical data. And uh, Gaia combines all these advantages in, in a single mission, and I think that is one of the keys to why the Gaia data have uh, created so much new science. The idea to make astrometric measurements from space uh, originated in the 1960s when the French astronomer Pierre Lacroute proposed a space mission for differential astrometric measurements over long arcs on the sky using a single telescope by putting a beam combiner, a, a, a mirror with two parts at an angle to each other in front of the telescope so that the telescope could simultaneously look in two different directions at a well-defined angle between them. But it took uh, 20 years or more uh, for this idea to be realized. Uh, Hipparchus was accepted by the European Space Agency in 1980 and launched in 1989. It was active for about three and a half years and the catalog was released in 1997. Of course, there were many uh, hundreds or even thousands of people involved in the development of this mission. Uh, I will show a few examples here of the, the Hipparchus during its development and testing. To the left we see the actual beam combiner mirror used in Hipparchus. The telescope uh, primary mirror is not more than 30 centimeter in diameter. That's about a, a, a typical amateur telescope. But of course it, it's a much more refined instrument than an than a amateur telescope. To the, the right we see the satellite during 
uh, testing in uh, one year before launch. Among the many people involved in developing uh, the mission, uh, I will mention these three persons in, in particular because they were leaders of the, the various Hipparco scientific consortia. One very big effort uh, with Hipparcos was to process the data and also to prepare the input catalog needed to uh, control the instrument. So Sean Kovalevsky was the leader of one of these data analysis consortia, and he was also instrumental in getting this originally French project brought up to a European level and therefore making it uh, possible to implement. Catherine Turand led the input catalog consortium that had the huge task of collecting all the necessary ground-based information, in particular positions to at least one arc second position for all the stars that were to be observed by this satellite. This was a huge effort that required many uh, uh, dedicated ground-based observations. And Eric Hoeg, who led uh, two of these data analysis consortia, and also contributed many original and crucial ideas for the realization of the Hipparchus project, and later also for Gaia. And uh, he is one of the initiators for the next uh, uh, space astrometry mission that we hope will be realized in 20 years or so, Gaia near infrared. In fact, Gaia was proposed in 1993, already before the Hipparchus catalog had been published. But at that point, it was clear that Hipparchus was going to be a big success. So we thought that it was a good idea to uh, propose something then, when everybody had uh, were uh, aware of the success that space astrometry really works. So Gaia was launched in 2013. Before that, there were a number of dedicated technology studies necessary to develop the technology needed for it, in particular uh, silicon carbide technology for the murals and structures. I have a picture here showing the, uh, the Gaia payload during its assembly two years before launch. Uh, at this time, one of the uh, primary mirrors is being mounted here on the ring-shaped uh, structure that carries all the mirrors and uh, detectors. Uh, and, and this uh, structure and the mirrors are all made of silicon carbide. Here we see the Gaia satellite uh, with a 10 meters uh, diameter solar array and sun shield deployed shortly before launch. And uh, from one month after launch and until today, um, and a few more years, Gaia is in an orbit around the second Lagrange point, uh, 1.5 million kilometers from the sun, uh, from the Earth. So I said that uh, uh, space uh, enables us to make uh, global astrometry. Now I have to explain what that exactly means. Uh, I'll try to formulate a definition here. To me, global astrometry means building an astrometric catalog such that the, uh, the angular separation of any two objects as calculated from this catalog can be computed with an accuracy that is essentially independent of the angle. Uh, this is uh, contrary to what I showed before, the dichotomy between the positional measurements with meridian circles and the differential measurements that were 10 or 100 times more accurate uh, in the small field of big telescopes. Uh, gl global astrometry means that there is no such difference between large-scale astrometry and small-scale astrometry. Such a global catalog defines an undistorted uh, reference frame for the positions and proportions of the objects. It does not have to be a non-rotating system, but it can easily be made non-rotated by including uh, a number of quasars among the, these objects and uh, forcing them, their proportions to be in the mean zero. If the objects are stars, you also need to include the parallaxes in this catalog and even radial velocities for some of the nearby stars to take into account perspective acceleration. 
this kind of global astrometry is really, really needed for a wide range of different studies. For example, an undistorted positional frame is needed to dynamically interpret the motions in the solar system. If you observe the motion of an asteroid relative to a distorted grid of positions, you will find that it accelerates and decelerates in a, fa in a way that is completely unphysical. And if you are not uh, aware of this, you might misinterpret these uh, uh, apparent accelerations as physical forces, perhaps from, from an unknown planet. Uh, you also need accurate positions for identification and mapping of sources across the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, to identify the corresponding sources in the optical and radio domain. And for a lot of other reasons like uh, telescope pointing, spacecraft navigation, and prediction of occultations of stars by asteroids. Similarly, you need an undistorted proper motion frame, for example, for dynamical interpretation of motions in our galaxy and local group, or for identification and mapping of stellar motions across our galaxy. And while you construct a global astrometry catalog, you get absolute parallaxes almost as a byproduct of, of this construction. Uh, I will elaborate these last two points, the mapping of stellar motions and absolute parallaxes, a little bit further. So one of the big uh, outcomes from the Gaia mission is the, the mapping and, and discovery of stellar streams and clusters and dwarf galaxies and their motions in the outer part of our galaxy. Um, it is illustrated here with a few plots from a, pa a recent paper by Malan et al. Uh, the, the point here is that in, in kinematic uh, space or in phase space, in velocity, these uh, stars can be quite tightly uh, clustered, meaning that they have very similar space velocities, but they could be scattered all over the sky. That is, for, for example, the case with the uh, Gaia Enceladus star stream, which is uh, believed to be remnant stars from the last major merger with, a, uh, with another galaxy size of the Magellanic cloud, large Magellanic cloud, uh, some 10 billion years ago. Uh, because this happened so long ago, these stars are now spread over, uh, spread over the whole sky. And if you are going to uh, successfully find these kind of streams, you need extremely accurate uh, propagations. Uh, and that was simply not available uh, before uh, space astrometry. And that is illustrated in this plot, which shows the systematic differences in propagations between the best compilation of ground-based propagations before Hipparchos, the PPM catalog, which listed propagations for almost 400,000 stars based on ground-based observations. Um, and uh, what is plotted here is the average distance between these propagations and propagations in the third release of Gaia data. You can see that uh, it is very inhomogeneous over the sky, and in some parts of the sky, there are systematic differences as large as 10 milliarc seconds per year. This is a huge effect if you are looking for these subtle stellar motion patterns that I referred to earlier. Uh, if you consider that the galactic rotation itself at the distance of the sun only corresponds to six milliarc seconds per year. Coming now to uh, absolute parallaxes. Uh, this plot, this diagram illustrates how uh, parallaxes were traditionally determined in small field um, uh, instruments like uh, long focus refractors um, until, uh, well, how it was necessary to do it from the ground, simply. You measured a tar nearby target star relative to a number of background stars. And here it is illustrated with just a single background stars. If you measure the angle between the target star and the background star at two points when the Earth is, uh, is at opposite 
ends of the orbit around the sun, so you get these angles A and B. You can easily see from this diagram that by taking the difference between these two angles, A minus B, what you get is twice the difference in parallax between the target star and the background star. In other, way, in other words, from that kind of measurement, you only can get the relative parallax of the target star. This is fine as long as there are plenty of background stars that are sufficiently distant, that their parallaxes are negligible or can be estimated statistically from their spectra or something. But if you are going to map uh, distances throughout our galaxies, there are no background stars. You might uh, use quasars, which have uh, negligible parallaxes, of course, but there are simply not enough quasars uh, to do that, and they are also faint, and there are hardly any to be found at low galactic latitudes in the galactic belt. Here, global astrometry comes to our help because if you can measure large angles as accurately as small angles, then you can measure parallax by, with respect to not a background star, but a reference star, roughly at 90 degree separation from the target star. And from this diagram, you can see that taking the difference of these two angles, A and B, now you get twice the absolute parallax of the target star. So that is the principle of parallax measurement used by both Hipparchus and Gaia. So how can you build a global astrometric catalog? In principle, it can be done by accurately measuring the arcs between many reference objects distributed over the sphere as illustrated here in this uh, very schematic uh, image. Uh, you need to ensure that these measurements are made over large, uh, large arcs, uh, meaning some, something from about 40 degrees to 140 degrees, because otherwise if you have a two, two short arcs, you will get accumulation of errors uh, when you go from one part of the sky to the next and they, they can't be too close to 180 degrees for the same reason. However, to do that in practice is quite difficult to design an instrument that is capable of, of measuring very accurately uh, a whole range of, of angles between 40 and 140 degrees. But what you can do is to construct um, an instrument with uh, two fields of view that are set at a fixed so-called basic angle between them. And this basic angle then should be in the interval from 40 to 140 degrees. And this is exactly the original idea of Lacoute. What you need then is a sufficiently large field uh, and a high enough star density that at every point in time you have a number of stars in both the fields of view so that you can connect them together. And you also need a continuous scanning approximately along the great circle through the two fields of view. I will explain later why this scanning is essential. Uh, this is the Gaia payload again during integration, but at a later stage where you can see both the primary mirrors uh, looking in two different directions separated by a basic angle of 106.5 degrees and uh, by some complicated set of mirrors and a beam combiner the light from these two mirrors eventually end up on a common focal plane uh, in the camera shown at the bottom of the figure. So effectively, you observe two fields of view on the sky. Uh, they are called preceding and following field of view uh, as the satellite rotates. But on the camera, you see the two fields superposed. And yeah, on the, if you on the detector measure the angle between two star images from opposite fields of view, you then simply have to add the basic angle to this measured angle to get the true angle on the sky. And then you have measured a large angle and that can be used then to build a global uh, system of astrometry. There is, uh, of course, the, 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 the Scanning of the instrument must be such that uh, you cover the whole sky as quickly as possible. So the rotation axis is not fixed, but is uh, slowly changing so that in um, a few months you cover a large part of the sky. 
And the plot to the right shows the sky coverage that will be used for the fourth release of Gaia data. It shows the density of observations for 63 months of observations of roughly 7,500 revolutions of, of the satellite. And what you see here is, is the superposition of two patterns, one coming from the star density, which is uh, determined by the galactic, uh, um, galactic structure and the Magellanic clouds, uh, and the second pattern, which is this uh, uh, um, arcs that is seen over the whole sky, comes from the scanning law. Uh, and that depends on the number of observations that you have on each star. There is one uh, problem uh, that needs to be addressed, however. Uh, as I said, to, to convert the measurements on the detector to the true angles on the sky, you need to add the basic angle. But that means that you need to know the basic angle and you need to know it to micro arc second position. So how is that possible? And you not only need to know the basic angle, there are many other parameters like the image scale, the orientation of each CCD on the focal plane and so on. And also the, the celestial pointing or the attitude of the satellite at every point in time uh, is needed to also to micro arc second accuracy. All of this is achieved by a process that is called self-calibration. And it means that uh, you determine these additional parameters, nuisance parameters, they are sometimes called, namely the calibration and attitude, from the same observations as uh, the stellar parameters are determined. Uh, so no special calibration devices are needed uh, and no special calibration measurements. Uh, this uh, illustrates how this can be done. Uh, this illustrates how the basic angle is uh, determined to micro arc second precision or accuracy. Um, during a six hour period when the satellite rotates a full uh, 360 degrees, you measure thousands of stars roughly along a great circle. And if you assume some value of the basic angle, you can compute the angle between pairs of stars in the opposite fields of view. Now, if you start by one star and go to the next uh, and go around uh, a number of times, eventually you end up with the, the star that you started with. And if you add all of these angles together, you should get a multiple of 360 degrees. That is, if you use the correct value for the basic angle. If you had assumed the wrong value, you will not get 360 degrees, but you can compute what the angle should be. So that means that for every complete revolution, for every six hours scanning by the satellite, you get a very precise estimate of the basic angle. So this uh, puts uh, the requirement on, on the satellite that it has to be stable over six hours but it does not have to be stable over six months, for example, in order to determine parallax. Uh, and that is a, a very big difference for, for the engineers. They can construct something that is stable over a few hours, but not over years. For this process to work, you need to avoid certain values of the, of the basic angle, like uh, 180 degrees, 90 degrees, 60 degrees, and so on. The, simple fractions of 360 degrees. And indeed that was used for both Hipparchus and Gaia. The basic angles were carefully selected to avoid these uh, bad values. Uh, mathematically, it is uh, very simple to formulate uh, the um, self-calibration as a least squares problem. And the solution to such a least squares problem has been known for uh, over 200 years, at least in principle how it should be done. But in practice for uh, the global astrometry problem, it is quite difficult because of the large number of parameters involved and the non-trivial way that they are connected to each other via the two fields of view and the scanning law. In fact, a direct solution using sparse matrix algebra is unfeasible by many orders of magnitude in terms of CPU time and storage requirements. Already in 1976, it was estimated that to do the Hipparchus uh, data processing in this way would require 200 years of CPU time on the most powerful computer available at that time. Today, that would probably be feasible 
but it is not feasible for Gaia because uh, there are so many more unknowns and observations involved. So a different method is uh, used for solving this, namely iterative methods, which are standard for solving large sparse uh, system of equations. Uh, the principle for that is very, uh, is very simple. If you start with an initial very approximate estimate of the attitude and calibration, you can compute for one star at a time its astrometric parameters. You will not get very good results, but it is a starting point. And then you can use this together with um, the uh, calibration parameters to get the attitude as a function of time. And then you can use the attitude and source parameters to estimate the calibration parameters. And at that point, when you are in the blue box uh, to the lower right, you have improved estimates of both the attitude and calibration that, uh, compared to what you started with. And then you can uh, go back and update the star parameters again. So essentially, you have to loop through this um, a sufficient number of time for convergence, that is, when the parameters don't change anymore. And in practice, it turns out that this requires of the order of 200 iterations. But it does converge to nu the numerical accuracy of your computations. And what you get then is the same result, at least in principle, as for a direct solution, but with a, uh, uh, much more feasible uh, requirements in terms of CPU time and uh, storage. I should remind that AGIS is, of course, just a small part, uh, although very important and central, of the Gaia data processing. So there is a lot of other processes and people involved to generate all the data that come out in a release, not only astrometry, but also uh, photometry, object classification, uh, radial velocities for the brighter stars, high resolution spectroscopy for the brighter star, low resolution spectroscopy for the fainter stars, um, and so on. And all of this is uh, freely available in the Gaia archive on the, on the web. Of course, Gaia cannot do everything uh, by itself. Uh, it can be extended in sensitivity, that is, uh, to fainter objects by means of large ground-based telescopes, and similarly in precision by means of interferometers or space telescopes, resolution, time baseline uh, can be improved backwards using archival data from HST, for example, or Hipparchos, and uh, into the future uh, by means of uh, perhaps the next uh, space astronomy mission, Gaia Near Infrared. And it also needs a lot of complementary data, especially spectroscopic surveys, uh, to get radial velocities, abundances, and so on. And there are lots of ground-based projects going on uh, to, um, to provide that kind of information. So Gaia is advancing our understanding of all sorts of things from the solar system out to quasars and cosmology. Uh, my next few slides are just a few illustrative examples of, uh, of the quality and richness of the data. For example, using the second release of data, Wei Chun Yao et al. found in 2018 that there was a gap in the lower main sequence um, HR diagram. And this is believed to be uh, caused by a change in the internal structure of stars uh, if it has a mass less than 0.35 solar masses or above that, um, which cha changes its luminosity in, in, a, in a discrete way. Uh, if we didn't have this gap, it would be easy to think that the scatter that we see to the right is just uh, observational noise. But this gap shows clearly that, uh, uh, there is, uh, um, that most of this scatter is astrophysical. The phase spiral was discovered also in DR2 data by Antoja et al. in 2018. It is a signature of oscillations of stars uh, up and down uh, with respect to the galactic plane. Uh, and, and this was excited by some event a few hundred million years ago. And it is believed uh, that uh, this was the latest passage of the Sagittarius Dwarf galaxy through the galactic plane. In the 
third release of data, this uh, pattern can be mapped more, much more accurately and over a wider range of space. And it then shows that in the inner part of the galaxy, it's actually a double spiral. So there is probably, it is probably a different mechanism that excites the oscillations, uh, probably from the bar or spiral arms. Uh, star formation rate uh, can be estimated from fitting synthetic color magnitude diagrams to the data. Um, and again, this shows uh, bursts of star formation at discrete times. And uh, this too is believed to be related to the pericenter passages of the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy. And finally, in Gaia DR3 data, it was possible to uh, detect the acceleration of the solar system pericenter from the proper motions of quasars. Uh, because of its orbit in our galaxy, the velocity vector of the solar system barycenter, which is about 250 kilometers per second, that velocity is changing by one centimeter per second every year. And this small change in the velocity creates a small difference in the stellar aberration of the quasars that uh, make uh, this uh, characteristic pattern of uh, propamations. What is shown here is not the actual propamation of these quasars because that is dominated by the noise, but the fitted uh, model of this acceleration, which amounts to five, which has an amplitude of five micro arc seconds per year and is determined to an accuracy of about 0.35 micro arc seconds per year. So this shows that in, in in, in this context, this uh, statistical sample of uh, more than a million quasars uh, scattered over the whole sky, Gaia is already achieving accuracies below the micro arc second. So this is my final slide. Uh, the Hipparchus and Gaia missions are the result of a development process stretching over more than 50 years and involving some forward-looking key decisions and the sustained support by multiple space agencies, the long-term engagement of many hundreds of scientists, engineers, and administrators in academia and industry, and of course, an ent enthusiastic user community. But the sky continues to change, so let's hope that, this, that Gaia is not the end point of this process. And we already have a candidate for the next uh, uh, space astronomy mission, uh, Gaia near infrared. Thank you. I'd like to thank our speaker for this very nice uh, trip from the early times of astrometry to the fantastic results of and sophistication of Gaia. And I think we will have time for one question if there is one in the audience. I will check if there is any online. I, I don't see any. Oh, you have a question there, please. Um, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I'll just ask for fun since nobody else is asking. Um, prior to Hipparchus, the person, not the satellite uh, with the thousand uh, stars, I imagine there would have been a little bit of uh, relative uh, astrometry, particularly, uh, you know, that would be useful for things like studies of binary stars. Uh, any comments on that? Yes, uh, binary stars is a, is a good example of objects that can be studied using differential ast astrometry. And that was, of course, done very successfully already uh, more, more than 100 years ago. Uh, I, I would like to point out, for example, that the, the first uh, white dwarf was discovered uh, from the uh, perturbations on Sirius that were uh, measured with this kind of uh, 
in this way. So yes, indeed, for, for binaries, you can get a lot of information from observations in a small field. I think we still have another. Please go ahead, another question. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I'm Jackie Ma from the Australian National University. So you showed a lot of great results from uh, Gaia about studies of uh, especially a lot of things in the Milky Way. So can you give a few comments on the prospects of Gaia or the next generation instruments on the study of the Magellanic system? Uh, yes, I, I hinted on that, uh, that there is a proposal for the next uh, uh, space astrometry mission called Gaia N N I R for Gaia Near Infrared. Uh, the idea is to, to do basically the same kind of observations as Gaia, also a scanning uh, survey, but to uh, enable it to look uh, much further into near infrared, hopefully all the way to about two microns, which means that you can see all the way into the center of our galaxy, because that is, of course, one of the... Uh, areas where Gaia can, cannot do very well. It cannot see through all the extinction in the galactic plane and especially into the center. So that, that would be really great. And it will also uh, improve the uh, discovery of brown dwarfs and many other kind of, of systems and highly uh, reddened star and so on. So, uh, but at the same time, that, that mission would also observe in the visual area so that we have a, a very good connection with Gaia and can compute, for example, uh, proper motions by combining the observations. And these proper motions would then be a factor 10 better than Gaia provides. Thank you. If there are no more questions, I'd like to applaud our speaker again. Thank you for a very nice talk. Thank you.